Welcome to this edition of AFMC. I'll tell you how I got better. I'm glad to be here. But a mission to deliver it. Well, I think that we're, we're talking, we're going to talk about everybody's. Arkansas is the second highest prescriber. Welcome to this episode of AFMC TV. I'm Robin Ledbetter. Thank you for joining us. Today I have with me Dr. Mary Chatelaine. She is an audiologist at Pinnacle Hearing. Dr. Chatelaine, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So a new recent study says that everyday noises, the white noise, the hearing devices, all the things that we're, we're hearing from earbuds have really affected children's hearing. What are you seeing? So, you know, there's some recent studies that have come out specifically talking about sleep machines. You know, um, I personally never use those with my children, but I do know I have a lot of friends who use those and they have been talking about how, you know, these machines can cause hearing loss because they're not really being regulated. And, um, you know, a sleep machine is basically just a white noise machine. So it's gonna be equal, um, volume at all frequencies. A baby can be exposed to noise developing ears are not designed for. So with the noise machines, you need to keep them at least seven feet away, put on a low volume setting. There needs to be time limits. It doesn't need to be running all night, just whenever you're needing it for that baby to fall asleep. So once the baby falls asleep, turning it off. Also never place it in the crib. Also, whenever we are talking about some of these different noises that are um, detrimental to kids' hearings, earbuds and the iPods, or we don't have iPods anymore, do we? <laughs> AirPods. <laughs> AirPods. <laughs> AirPods come to mind. Um, children do have smaller ear canals and it's going to make sound louder. So it's going to make them more likely to be affected by noise. The output volume of most headphones, most, most AirPods are between 70 decibels up to about 100, 110 decibels. All right, anything above 70 decibels can cause hearing damage for an extended period of time. You can be exposed to it briefly and it's not gonna cause hearing damage, but over time, if you're listening to that consistently, it's gonna cause hearing damage. Um, decibels of 120 or greater can cause immediate harm. So that's like an impulse sound where you could have hearing loss permanently. Um, you don't have to just take the AirPods and the headphones away from kids. You know, that's not the answer. The main thing is just we need to regulate it more and be aware that kids shouldn't be listening to these and have them in their ears all day. You want to keep the listening device at about 60 to 70 percent of the total volume. It doesn't need to be up at the highest volume. Also, if my daughter's sitting here and I can hear the music, that means it's too loud. Or if I'm talking in a normal tone and she can't hear me, that means that she's got the devices up too loud. With these things, with the sleep machines, with, hair, with um, earphones, we just need to regulate it a little bit more. And is it is there an earbud that you know you put in the ear, or is it a headphone that you think is that's better or less um, problematic, or does it matter? You know, I think that the AirPods are going to be a little bit more problematic just because they're easier to wear, and um, you know the headphones are usually bulky. They really um, people don't usually wear those extended times like they do the AirPods. So I feel like that's causing more of an issue. Plus it's going to sit a little further down in your canal. So should a parent carry those noise canceling headphones in their car or with them if they've got a baby and they're they're going to be say at an outdoor concert or something with loud music? I, I noticed those are a little more uh, popular than they used to be. Yes, so noise canceling, uh, canceling earphones are going to be a little bit different than earmuffs to protect hearing. So noise canceling, um, how those work is typically you're still being able to listen to audio and it's canceling out the noise around you. So you can still get that really loud. But when it comes to um, earmuffs, um, hearing protection, definitely. Um, for babies, we have these cute little earmuffs where it's like a little band around their head and they can wear those. You definitely don't want to be sticking foam plugs in a baby's ear, but um, we're um, using those. So if you're going to a football game, to a Razorback game, it gets loud. Maybe not as loud right now, but <laughs> it gets really loud. And so they definitely need to be wearing those. Um, any type of concert events. I mean, really for the younger ones, trying to keep them out of those environments is gonna be the best. But if they must go wearing the hearing protection. Now for adults, and for teens, you can use the earplugs that are foam. You can buy those anywhere. Um, we have them at Pinnacle. You basically are just going to twist them 
with your fingers a little bit and then insert them into your ear and they'll expand to fit properly. That's gonna be a whole lot better than nothing. Um, the Circum Oral earphones that go over your ear that you typically, you know, you kind of think of back in the day, we use those. Those are usually the best because they are gonna provide the most attenuation. Then you can also double it up where you have the inserts in your ear and the headphones over your ear. But I would definitely, in those situations, fireworks, concerts, um, sporting events, wear hearing protection when you can. And what are some signs that parents should look for with hearing loss? Okay, so um, with hearing loss, if a if the child is talking too loud, so if they just seem like they're talking a whole lot louder than the normal tone, if they are having any speech and language delays, if they're having a hard time pronouncing certain words, um, that's a sign. Struggling in school, um, not being able to thoroughly hear the teacher, maybe there's a decline in their grades. Um, those are gonna be the, be the most important things we look at. Um, now, after they've been exposed to noise, some red flags that they could have damage is gonna be um, if they have any pain in their ears, if they suddenly have tinnitus, if they get out of the noisy situation and it's still like a little muffled and they can't hear, um, those are gonna be signs that under that noisy environment, they might have received some noise exposure. And there, there has been quite a bit of improvement within hearing testing over the last 10 years. I know I remember sitting in elementary school and wearing the headphones and hearing the little ringing. That's changed a lot. It's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, so typically in schools, what they do is screenings. And usually that is you hear the beep, raise your hand when you hear the beep. Um, and we still do that. Now, a lot of the times with screenings, what we're able to do is instead of the circum oral, we can do insert earphones, which allows um, for, for things to be a little bit more accurate. Um, in the booth, we are able to put kids in the soundproof booth to do the full audiological testing. So, you know, we have parents all the time that their kid fails at school and they get really concerned. And they say, oh goodness, my kid might have a hearing loss. I need to come in for a hearing test. And um, definitely if your child fails at the school screening, definitely get an appointment. But we're able to do a whole lot more thorough testing in the audiology setting where we're able to determine is there a hearing loss or was it just um, an issue with the screening. And what do you want healthcare providers to know if they're seeing often at a wellness visit or if, if a parent brings a child in, when should they refer to you? Um, if there is any struggle in school, if there is a speech and language delay, um, if the child is talking a whole lot louder um, in certain situations, if there is any pain or drainage in the ear, um, if there's ringing in the ears, if there is a sudden hearing loss or if there is hearing is better or significantly worse in another ear. If there's anything that's asymmetrical that we definitely want to um, get that checked out. Well, you've given some really great information. Let's let's switch gears for just a second because I want to know about um, over-the-counter hearing aids. Those are now um, something you can go into a pharmacy, any store and buy. Yes, so over-the-counter hearing aids have really been around for a long time. You've been able to purchase these things over the um, internet, you know, over the phone. They were more called amplifiers, but now there's FD, FDA regulations for over-the-counter hearing aids. So these are really designed for people who have mild hearing loss, who are wanting to hear but not ready for the full investment of medical grade hearing aids. They are not meant for children. Um, they are not meant for certain individuals. Um, for example, if you have an asymmetric hearing loss where one ear is better than the other, if you have any pain in your ears, any drainage, if you have excessive earwax, um, if you have ringing that's just in one ear, these are gonna be things that you need to stay away from over-the-counter hearing aids. You need to go um, to a professional to get your hearing evaluated. Over-the-counter hearing aids, there is kind of a love-hate relationship with them among people in my field because what it does is it takes the provider out of the equation. So basically, it's just gonna be direct to consumer. You know, there are some people that can handle that, um, but the majority of patients that we see that have done the over-the-counter product, 
they need the help. They need to be shown how to put the hearing aid in. They need it programmed to their hearing loss. They need different modifications to it. They need to come in um, quarterly for us to clean the hearing aids. You know, they'll get a device in the mail and they're, they don't know how to put it on. They don't know if they have it in right. They get earwax stuck in it, then it doesn't work. And so that's with over the counter what's difficult is it just takes the provider out of it. But, you know, over the counter, what we're hoping is the average um, time frame where somebody has an issue with hearing and they actually come in to see a professional is about seven years. That's a long time, you know, that their family's mentioning it to them. It takes them seven years to realize, okay, I need something needs to be done about this. What we're hoping is we start lessening that time with over the counter products, that those people that are struggling, they start to use these devices. The over-the-counter hearing aids are not custom fit. So they're not really something that someone who needs to wear hearing aids every day is going to want to use all the time because they, they don't fit right, they look a little bit different, plus they're not going to have that help in getting the proper fit. So one last question. Tell us how telemedicine has really changed your practice. With Can you, can you get a hearing test or see an audiologist via tele? visit? Yes, so we can do screenings that way. When it comes to doing a full diagnostic evaluation, you're definitely going to need to go in and see a provider. But for follow-up visits with hearing aids, it's amazing. So we have patients here um, that come into Little Rock for a fitting, but maybe they live about three hours away. So all their follow-up visits, we're able to do via telehealth or teleaudiology. So um, if we need to make adjustments to their hearing aids, we put a remote care app on their phone where we can um, talk to them over video, see how it's going, what changes we need to make. I can make those adjustments, then send them to the patient and they upload it. And right there we can see, all right, is this better? Is this worse? And so it really helps us be able to service more people. Um, we've got so many patients too that they have loved ones that need to drive them in. And so it really minimizes the need for the daughter or the grandson to have to do an hour drive to come to see us. We're able to do so much in just counseling and making follow-up adjustments. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so interesting, and technology has really changed it's so much to, to help us in a lot of ways, but very interesting that it's helping you within the audiology field. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I love it. Well, this has great, been great information. I've learned a lot. I appreciate you so much being here. Thank All right, you. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of AFMC-TV. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.